beautiful sister. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Tara and I am so excited to sit down today and deep dive into God's word with you. So the reason why I'm doing this, this is going to be a six week series. It may seem like a lot, but it's just going to be one video once a week like I normally do. We're gonna be going through the book of Ephesians in the Bible together, one chapter per video, one chapter per week. The reason why I wanted to do this is because A, Ephesians is one of my absolute favorite books of the Bible. Right now, if you guys have your favorite book of the Bible, any book, let me know, drop it in the comments below. And secondly, the reason I wanted to do this is because I have such a passion for helping other women to discover how to read God's word because the more we understand it, the more we know how to read it, what it says, what it means for our lives, how we can worship God and know him better, the more on fire for him we will be, the more um, strong and bold in our faith we will be. And this Bible is literally our roadmap for life and it helps us in so many ways. So I have such a passion for this. This is why I wanted to do this study with you guys to learn some awesome things about Ephesians, but also then maybe you can walk away knowing some more things about the Bible. So to make sure that this video isn't too long, because <laughs> I know I'm pretty long-winded sometimes, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to be reading the whole entire chapter and then stopping occasionally to talk about some main points. Meaning, I mean, I could talk about every single verse. We could chat about every single verse together, but that would take a long time. So I'm just gonna pick out some main points, um, how to understand it better, maybe some words that are confusing, and just study it together. So. I'm going to be reading out of my Hosanna Revival Bible today, which is this absolutely gorgeous Bible. You guys can definitely check them out in the description box. I will have them linked. They are my favorite Bibles and absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to be reading out of this one today, but another thing that I will, will recommend you guys to get if you want to be a better studier of God's Word is a study Bible. This is the ESV study Bible. I will again link everything down below, any tools and resources that are so helpful for you guys um, in the description box. This is such a good Bible. Um, because it gives study notes at the bottom to help you understand confusing words in context. So it is so good. It seems a little bit like scholarly school-esque, but it is so helpful for your understanding and for the ability to live it out in your life. So to start, make sure you have um, a notebook handy, a pen, um, your laptop if you want to write down any notes or anything. Um, I do this all the time when I'm studying the word because I'm such like a mind to hand learner where I have to be writing something down. So if that's you, go ahead and grab your Bible, grab a notepad, whatever, and let's get started. So before we start, I wanted to give you a little bit of context, which I think is so important when you're reading the Bible. And when I say context, I mean who the author was, why he wrote it, where he was, what the theme was, um, what life really looked like, because it's really important not to take scripture out of its context, out of where it was originally written, because that gives us so many clues for how we're supposed to read it. And that's where we get the phrase taken out of context. We want to keep things in context. So the book of Ephesians was written by a man named Paul. I'm sure a lot of you guys know who that was. His name before his name was Paul. Yes, he had two different names was Saul. So he, this guy was the worst of all guys before he became Paul, before he met Jesus. Spoiler alert. His name was Saul. He grew up in a very legalistic home. He was raised by a Pharisee dad, meaning um, his dad was one of the officials that was a Pharisee, meaning very legalistic. Um, the Pharisees, the group of Pharisees was actually the people who plotted to kill Jesus. And so Paul, I mean Saul, grew up in this very just legalistic way and he grew up to be a persecutor of the Jews, a persecutor of Christians, people that believed in Jesus because he didn't believe that what they thought and what they believed in Jesus Christ was true. We're not really sure if he um, physically killed them himself, but he really persecuted them by throwing them into jail, taking away their um, religious freedoms, their worship freedoms. So that was who Paul was. And then God reveals himself to Saul. And that's when he immediately converts. That's when he chooses to switch his life over. God convicts him of what he was doing and he becomes a Christian. He actually becomes a pastor, a preacher. So this is who wrote the book of Ephesians. His mission after meeting Jesus completely changed. He believed in God, he wanted to spread his name, so he wrote these letters and he went to different churches and to different cities and told them about Jesus and was a professional encourager. Let's dive in to the book of Ephesians. So the book of Ephesians was written to a specific church in the town of Ephesus. And this church had really awesome leaders. It had some 
really like solid theology. They knew what they were believing, but Paul had gotten word from a friend that they had lost their first love. What he meant by this was that they had built their foundation, their faith on such a solid foundation of Christ, but then they had lost their first love. They had gone and gotten distracted by other things. So Paul wrote this to encourage the Ephesian church. Here are two themes that I want you to keep in mind or write down throughout the whole book of Ephesians. That way you can see it woven throughout the whole letter. The first theme is all about God creating unity. So basically God's purpose, one of God's purposes for this book was to establish unity in the body of Christ, meaning the church, meaning his believers, anyone who claimed themselves to be a Christian and someone who had given their life to Jesus. The second theme is that God had united everyone from all nations, all tribes and all tongues. Um, at the beginning, um, a lot of people didn't believe that the Gentiles, another group of people, were able to receive Jesus, that Jesus didn't die for the Gentiles, but we know that Jesus died for everyone. So another one of Paul's themes was talking about how everyone is invited and accepted into this salvation. And it was all done by the salvation and victory of Jesus on the cross. Okay, so now we're gonna get into reading the chapter together. Like I said, this video will be on chapter one and the next videos will be on the following chapter. So I'm gonna read the chapter. You guys definitely follow along in your Bibles with me. I'm gonna stop occasionally at a few points and talk about the main points, how to understand what it's talking about, studying it, and then we'll just go from there. So beginning at Ephesians 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So in verse three, I'm gonna stop already. In verse three, Paul is talking about how he is just giving the sort of prayer, this sort of reminder of how blessed God's gift of Jesus was on the cross. He's saying, Jesus, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In these next few verses, Paul is going to be talking about how important Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was for our salvation. Back to reading. Verse four, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Just, just mind blowing, you guys. The concept of predestination basically means that God chose, God knew who was going to come to salvation, come to know him and put his trust in him before the very beginning of the world, before the foundations of the world were laid. And we know this and we can trust this because God, if we believe that God is all knowing and all powerful, we can trust that he has known this from the beginning. Like he says, we were predestined through Jesus Christ to be adopted into his family. I am adopted. So I love this part of the verse where it says that God used Jesus Christ as a way for us to be invited into his family through salvation. I just love that. This wasn't a flippant plan that God had. He had it before the foundations of the world began. He knew that Adam and Eve were gonna mess up. He knew that we would be faulty. He knew that everyone in this whole story was gonna be a failure and not deserve it, but God came. He had this plan of salvation worked out. He knew he was gonna send his son. God is the only one who can take credit for this. Let's get back to reading. Verse six says, um, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So the word redeemed, when you look up the word redeemed in the dictionary or even in one of the Bible dictionaries, the idea of being redeemed is to be bought with a price, is to be covered by someone else's sacrifice and payment for you. So Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross through the shedding of his blood to buy us back. Think about the Israelites in slavery in Exodus, in the book of Exodus. Um, God redeemed those people out of Egypt, out of slavery and called them out. It's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. He had to shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins to redeem us, to even make a way for us to come to know him. I'm gonna continue on in verse nine and then read through 10 and be listening in verse 10. It's a huge, huge major theme here. So in verse nine, it says, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he sent forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So like I said before, this wasn't a flippant plan. God had this laid down before the foundations of the world. And like verse 10 says, 
to unite all things in him, all things in heaven and on earth. Jesus' work on the cross was the glue that holds us all together. That is salvation at its core is the uniting that, that God had in mind. I'm going to continue on with the last part and just read it straight through 11 through 13. It says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantor of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You guys, did you hear that in verse 13? When we, this also applies to us, even though it was written to the Ephesians, that when we also heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Every true believer has the Holy Spirit in their lives. And the awesome thing is that that's our guarantee. That is one of the guarantees that we have of salvation and that we are going to spend an eternity in heaven, which like Paul says is our inheritance. Because we have the Holy Spirit, because we have put our trust in Jesus, we can look forward to our inheritance, which is restoration and eternity with God in heaven. So in your Bibles, you might have a section, like different sections, a lot of Bibles do. So mine has a second section right down here. That's 15, verse 15 through 23. And so this particular section is a prayer. I mean, this whole part, this whole first chapter is mainly a prayer, Paul's little like prayer and dedication to them. And this particular part, this last part that we're gonna talk about today is about um, Paul's desire for them to grow in their insight and knowledge of God. Paul wants them to grasp the realities that we as Christians have received in Jesus Christ's salvation, the realities that we have, the blessings, um, the encouragement that we have being in Christ. So I love this section. So let's start reading at verse 15. Verse 15 says, For this reason, because I, Paul, have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. So when Paul is saying the spirit of wisdom, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. You can again look in your study Bible, if you have a study Bible or any of the commentaries to help you understand this, but in verse 17, he is saying the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and knowledge of him. So like he's saying plain and simple the holy spirit is the one that helps us understand and comprehend the things in the bible the things of this life without him we would not have the knowledge or the know-how if you're a believer in jesus you can have the confidence that the holy spirit is working inside of you regardless of how you feel or what day it is you can have confidence and you can even pray to the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit in your prayers to reveal things to you. Because like it says in this verse, in verse 17, that he wants to reveal things to you. God wants to reveal his knowledge, insight for you to live your life better, to love others better, to serve him better. He wants to reveal that to you and it comes through the Holy Spirit. Let's continue on reading verse 18. Um, it says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might. Verse 20, That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he, meaning Jesus, put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all the things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So I know that was like a lot for that last section and Paul likes to use run on sentences. <laughs> um, but I wanted to emphasize one big main point before we end today's study is in verses 21 and 22. If you go back in your Bible, Paul is talking about um, the fact that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. So I looked in my study Bible, this ESV study Bible right here, and I looked in the notes and I was um, always wondered what he, uh, if he was just trying to emphasize his power or if there was something underlying. So in my study notes, it says that 
the Ephesians, like I was talking about earlier, they lost their first love. The Ephesians were struggling with seeing different people come onto the scene. They saw different people exercising magic. They saw cults. Yes, cults were still around, or I mean, were around in that time. And so they were seeing other powers come into play. And that's when they got distracted. And so Paul was trying to emphasize that through Jesus Christ, God himself is far above all rule, power, authority, and dominion because magic and sorcery and like, I mean, more like evil spirits, like all of that is real, you guys. But God is reminding us that he is above all of it. He deserves the praise. He goes far above and rules above them. Paul's reminding us again because of what Jesus did on the cross that God trumps every evil power, every secular power. And then in the last couple of verses, verses 22 and 23, Paul is again reminding us the unity theme again, be super insightful and remember these themes because it all ties in. Verse 22 and 23, Paul reminds us that Jesus is the head over all the things in the church which a lot of times, unless they're talking about it, like you can see that they're talking about a physical building, when the church, the word church is used in the New Testament, it, it really means the body of Christ, meaning a group of believers, all believers. And so he's reminding us that Jesus is the head over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul is making the claim that Jesus' body is literally the church. The church is literally his body, meaning it's not like we live in Jesus' body right now, but what he's saying is that Jesus is the head and he literally holds everything together in unity. And so we are all parts that spring off of Jesus, the body. Think of yourself as many representations of Christ. That's what I like to think of. Yes, we're not perfect and we are not like representations of him in that way. We'll never be until we meet him in heaven. But think of yourselves as little offshoots because if you are a part of Christ in the body, you are included in his body, but you are an offshoot of him because you are included in him because of what Jesus did on the cross. That was Ephesians 1, you guys. It was a really quick study of that. And there's a lot of more terms that we could dive in, but I hope that I was able to hit the main points. Um, to summarize, you guys, um, Paul was really just doing a really beautiful and broad summary of what he was gonna talk about next about how everything revolves around Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. So if you guys go back and read chapter one on your own, which I'd highly recommend that you guys do, um, look how many times that Paul talks about Jesus' death, resurrection, and just Jesus as a whole. So he is setting up this tone that everything that we have been blessed with, the unity that we have as a body of Christ is because of what Jesus did and we have a way to him now. So I really hope that that was encouraging. Leave any thoughts below, any verses, like give me a verse number if any of the verses in chapter one st stood out to you. I would love to hear um, what God showed you because God shows us all um, different things or makes different things stand out to us. I'm excited to talk more about the unity that we have in the body of Christ and all of the more encouragement that Paul has packed in this six chapter book, which is relatively short. So I'm so, so pumped and I hope you guys enjoyed this and that throughout these next couple weeks that we will be able to grow in our knowledge of God even more, even if you've read this book so many times before, and that maybe you'll be able to walk away with some cool ideas of how to study the Bible, some more practical strategies. If you guys haven't seen my video, it's one of my first videos I posted is how to study and live the Bible. I will link it up here and then down below if you guys can watch it. That's more practically how I read it. And so that way, maybe if you watch that, then maybe that'll help you study along with me in the next couple weeks. So I hope that you really enjoyed. I'll be praying over each one of you and I'm so excited to keep deep diving in with you guys. And thank you again for watching. Love you. I'll see you later.